Hello and welcome to the Total Clarity Podcast. I'm Jesse Hyatt. And I'm Mike Varley, and this is week 32 of our 52 week walk around New York City. That's right, and this week we're walking a route called the Native American Roads. We found a map that was made in 1946 by a man named James Kelly. He was a Brooklyn historian, and he had a particular fascination with Native American history, as well as with the wars that happened in Brooklyn. And he made this map that was called Indian Villages, Ponds, and Trails. Mm -hmm. And we used the trails on that map to make up our marathon walk for this week. That's right. So we'll uh, show the map on the uh, video and we'll also link to it. It's a really interesting story and it was interesting to do some follow-up on it, learn a little bit, and it was a a nice way to plot a route for the week. So we're going to do something a little bit different on this podcast. We always like to tweak everything just a little bit each time. Mm -hmm. So this go around, we did a bunch of video capture from two of the more prominent legs of the walk. Mm -hmm. One leg being the King's Highway and the other leg being the Shore Parkway slash Shore Park area that uh, hugs the bottom of Lower Bay, Brooklyn and goes under the Verrazano. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to give a little backstory, contemporary backstory, on those two areas. And then you can watch that footage while we talk a little bit about the Lenape culture, which we spent some time researching uh, for this week. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So starting with the King's Highway, it was first referred to as a highway in a document by Governor Peter Stuyvesant of then New Amsterdam on June 4th. 1654. Now, that doesn't mean that they commissioned a highway and started from scratch. In fact, the road was predating any colonial involvement. Mm -hmm. And as you would see on the map that we were using to form this route, it had a a Lenape origin. Right. And so the Lenape word, which, you know, I'm going to try my best, is Mekawaniank, and that word translates into ancient pathway. That's right. So it's kind of uh, interesting to imagine if it was referred to as ancient by the Lenape, how long it was being used prior to that. Right. That's a good point. Yeah, we're, we're thinking that the Native American time is sort of the earliest that we can sort of think back to in our history. But then to imagine that the Native American people were thinking of something as ancient is really kind of hard to wrap your head around. Yeah, exactly. So the contemporary road is actually shorter than the original road, quote unquote original, I guess Mm. colonial original version of the road was. Oh, really? Yeah, it would uh, actually uh, snake around to uh, as far as Uh, Fulton's Ferry, up where the Brooklyn Bridge is. Oh, wow. But as far as today's version, which we'll be talking about, it goes from Brownsville all the way down to Bensonhurst. Mm. It's crazy that you say that it's shorter now than it was previously, because that is a long road. Yeah. Yeah, it takes a a third of our route just to traverse. And it Yeah, I mean, it makes for an interesting way to break up the walk day because once you get down to the bottom, you you already know you're a third of the way through. That's true. And when you do it the other way and King's Highway is the end of the day, it really like by the end of King's Highway, you feel like you've you're just ready to get off that road. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And it uh, it really has some interesting character in a way that I would have to sit down maybe a little bit more and think about it, but I'm not sure there's another road quite like it in Brooklyn. I think there are some roads that maybe approximate it a little bit more in Queens, Mm -hmm. but it really does feel like a a major vehicle thoroughfare for parts of it. 
yeah. particularly the the Brownsville half going down. There's a, a lot of uh, space for vehicles and not a lot of, uh, I mean, there are homes and I kind of, I quite like the homes I as you'll too. see in the videos. They're kind of like row housey. Uh, yeah. A lot of them have uh, uh, these nice uh, stairways, you know, with like railings that mm -hmm. go up to them and um, they are offset from the road itself. There's a little bit of a, I guess what you call a median perhaps. Uh, between where there's like kind of a service road, so to well, speak. Well, there's yeah, it's like a service road. Yeah. Yeah. And or just like local side road or something. Yeah. 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 So you'll be seeing a lot of that, and then there's also a lot of both box stores and like fast food establishments, mm -hmm. which you might not find in other parts of Brooklyn. You know, the, right. in the in the because this area can service more cars, that type of store is able to exist. Yeah. It's and, also just really wide. Yeah. So if you're on one side of King's Highway, you're most likely staying on one side of King's Highway. Like yeah. to cross the road is a challenge. Yeah, for sure. And there's also, so that's kind of like the first half of the King's Highway. And there's also the Flatlands Reform Church, mm -hmm. uh, which is, it was established in 1654. Right. It is the second oldest in the state and among the 10 oldest in the country. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we took some footage of that and you'll be seeing that as we're talking. It's really nice, that church. It feels very welcoming and comfortable. Yeah. And yeah. also has something that I think is rare for Brooklyn. It has a lot of space. It has a yard. Yeah. It has like a lot of green space and it looks like it could be kind of anywhere. Yeah. If you look at photos from as far back as 100 years ago, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit longer, there you can see that large stretches of the King's Highway were very pastoral mm. and it kind of retains a little bit of that aura. I guess because the church has been around for so long, it's been able to maintain that amount right. of land. Right. And it uh, it is, meanwhile, in the middle of, you know, I guess at that point it's kind of uh, transitioning between the smaller row houses and the taller uh, apartment buildings. Right. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And so from there... Well, that... Yeah. That church what else is notice notable about that church is that there's a graveyard yes there is yep and the graveyard has um graves that are dating back from the I, well i don't know if it goes all the way back to the 1650s mm -hmm. to be honest but uh there are definitely i saw a lot of 1800s ones as well yeah and that's probably why they're able to keep so much space too mm -hmm. yeah perhaps i don't know how that i mean i guess we move graves all the time here but i think that they've just been able to retain the land because they've had it and then have yeah. never relinquished it right so Good for them yeah and from there it kind of goes into the it's it's unclear if it's like midwood or madison yeah but there's a, a large stretch of shops that really have some great character to them it becomes less about being a uh vehicle thoroughfare, although of course mm -hmm. there are a lot of vehicles going back and forth, and more about a walkable, you know, get all your types of uh, purchasing done. Right. And there's a lot of old school stores. And it, yeah, that's it has a nice character that it retains. Yeah, I like it a lot. There's also a lot of older people doing their grocery shopping, it feels like, or going to the pharmacy. Yeah. Sort of that vibe of, it feels like you're in a little neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. And then that that pretty much takes you to the end down into Bensonhurst. There's a slight detour that we went on this week that you'll see a little bit of when you see a second cemetery. That's Gravesend Cemetery. Mm -hmm. And that is founded in 1658, another old spot in New York City. Right. And Gravesend is notable as it is, it was founded by Lady Deborah Moody, and she oh. was the only woman to have started a colonial village in America. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was cool. And you can still see, if you go on to Google Maps, 
the impression of the original town square. It is this quite literal square in the middle of, uh, you know, what otherwise is not gridded and much more, you know, uh, loopy and whatnot around it. So, yeah. Uh, that was cool to, to and reference. And that was her, her design or her sort of, her town that had that in it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you'll be seeing all of that as we're talking along. Right now you're just seeing the first leg of the King's Highway route. But we hope you enjoy kind of just casually strolling as we did along. Yeah. And from there we uh, go to what it was another pretty big chunk of our route, which is along the Shore Park, Shore Park Parkway section. Right. So the Shore Parkway runs, what would that neighborhood be? Like, is that still Gravesend where you pick it up? I'm not it's almost sure. It's Coney Island. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's Bath Beach. Bath Beach? Yeah, so Coney Island technically there's the Coney Island Boat Basin mm -hmm. right near where Shore Road starts, but Coney Island is across that little area of water. Mm. So you, you pick up Shore Parkway or Shore Road or Shore Park, I think it has a couple different names, near Bath Beach, and it runs all the way up to the Verrazano. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, and then Fort Hamilton is there and whatnot. Oh, yeah. It all, runs all the way past the Verrazano. <laughs> <laughs> It runs up to an area in Bay Ridge, right, is where you get off? Shore Road, yeah. yeah. It goes up to Owl's Head Park. Owl's Head Park. Yeah. And right around there, so you're walking the whole way along the water, mm -hmm. which is really nice. And it leaves you very open to the elements. That's right. This particular day, we're recording this on Thursday night. and. It was blowy. It was blowy it was out there. Super blowy today. To the point where it was pushing us around. We've only really experienced wind more strong once, and that was when we were walking in one of our tropical storms earlier this year. Yeah. So it was quite an experience. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, we were ready for it. We knew it was going to be windy. It's also the middle of the winter. We knew the temperatures were going to be in the 20s and the 30s. So. I wore three layers of long underwear on my legs, plus my snow pants. Yeah, it was in the teens with the wind chill. Yeah. And we have one more day of cold weather to come. Perhaps yeah. the coldest day of the project. We'll find out tomorrow. Oh, we'll find out. But it was great to be down there. I, it had this really great sunny quality, which, which I personally love about the winter time, where the light reflects off of the water and everything feels clean and bright. And much like it was back when we were there in October, it mm -hmm. was very easy to put myself in the place of where you could imagine what it was like before all of this was here. Right. Even Even though there's cars on one side of you running past and even though you can still see the settlements on Staten Island, the, mm -hmm. the, the big expanse of water uh, really uh, captures a little bit of that. Because there's not a, lot of, uh, not a lot of buildings other than what you can see in the distance in Staten Island. Right. Yeah, I think, of course, yeah, the highway, the Belt Parkway runs along it to your side. And that takes you out of it. But I, I agree with you. The, the water... And how the water is always different depending on the weather. Like today with it being so windy, it was really choppy and green. And then the other day it was really sort of calm and bluish. Mm -hmm. That makes you feel like you could maybe start to imagine this place before it was all covered in concrete. Yeah. Of course, the part, the path that we're walking on is also concrete. Right. But <laughs> you can still start to imagine imagine it. Yeah. And this was also part of the native roads paths on the map that we were using to right. follow. And it has a special significance as the first Lenape contact with the Europeans came in 1524, almost 500 years ago. Just a few, you know, we're only three right. years away from the 500 year anniversary. Oh, wow. 
when Giovanni de Verrazano mm. came in on his boat and the Lenape met that boat with canoes. Right. And so that happened right around the place where the Verrazano Bridge is currently? Yeah, right in the Gravesend Bay, Lower Bay, New York area. Right. And also, something that I actually just learned this week, maybe you already knew it, Mike, that stretch of water there running between Staten Island and Brooklyn, mm -hmm. where the Verrazano Bridge is, is yeah. called the Narrows. The Verrazano Narrows, yeah. Well, I've always known it's the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, but I never knew what the Narrows part right. meant. Did you, so you already knew that the Narrows is that. It's I guess it's a, a called a strait, mm -hmm. and it's just part of the water that runs in between the two islands, uh -huh. and that's called the Narrows. Yeah. I mean, that's all making sense to me. Whether or not I knew it in <laughs> advance, I'm not quite sure. Right. But so, yeah, so that area where, I guess, Lower Bay, Gravesend Bay, the Narrows, they all hit each other. That's where that person, Verrazano, landed right. and where the Lenape people sailed out on their canoes to, to meet those boats. Yeah. And since we're sort of talking about it, in that particular area, so we're going to talk more about the Lenape people in Brooklyn in, in a little bit, but... Just a quick little primer, there were 13 different groups of people mm -hmm. spread out throughout Brooklyn. Yeah. So they were all Lenape, but split up into different groups. Mm -hmm. And in that particular area were the Nyack, mm -hmm. and Nyack means fishing place. Mm -hmm. So I think that probably... I mean, that area must have been where fishing happened. You know, yeah. it makes sense that it's on the water. Yeah. But I guess specifically right there is where a lot of fish were caught. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I mean, it looks like it would be a pretty bountiful area. Yeah. And the fact that you could get from one island to the other probably makes it, you know, a common place as well. Sure, yeah. So before we roll into the Lenape history portion in earnest, we just wanted to give a little bit of a preamble, much like we gave before the Revolutionary War episode, mm -hmm. which is that anytime we do a week where there is something that we're discussing that is either historically significant or culturally significant, particularly when it's just the two of us talking, uh, we want to say that, you know, what we're talking about is based on our desire to learn more about a given subject. And because we are not, you know, masters of what we're talking about, or are we spending, you know, a year researching just one thing, which right. we very easily could, the perspective we're coming from is one of enthusiasm and one of wanting to learn more. And if it's something that you're hearing that is, making you enthusiastic, that's awesome. If it's something that you know more about, we'd love to hear about it from you. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we just want to be clear that we're coming from a place of interest and reverence for a given topic at any time. Yeah. And if there's things that you hear and you want to learn more, we probably won't be able to answer a lot of your questions. Learning more would probably come on your own. Uh, or going to someone that is more of an expert. And I think we'll probably reference as we're talking some of the places in New York City that you can actually learn more about the Lenape people. Yeah, but we had a really interesting time learning about all this stuff and yeah. we're excited to talk about it. And yeah, we just wanted to make sure that that was clear because we want to respect the history of uh, people that lived here before us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so where do you want to start? Well, since we've already started talking a little bit about the Lenape living in Brooklyn, why don't we explain a little bit about who the Lenape people were and still are? Great. So the Lenape people, or the Lene Lenape, uh -huh. or the Delaware people, there are three different kind of names that are going there. The Lene Lenape, uh, Lene is like an autonym. It's kind of like how uh, Germans would refer to themselves as like Deutsch, you know? Like, Lene is what the Lenape people would call themselves? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
And so uh, it means real person or original person. Okay. Which I thought was kind of cool, like a, like a like an origin of man type thing. Right. I actually read it translated also as just the people, which yeah. I think is the same kind of thing. And in that, I read that actually a lot of different indigenous peoples throughout the entire world have a name. Of course, it's not Lenape, but a name that translates in their own language to something very similar to that. Yeah. So, yeah, it kind of speaks to this time when maybe people thought that they were the only ones. Right. Or, or maybe there was some sense of having some claim to originality, which mm. is a kind of a common human theme. Yeah. But in, in any event, it was, you know, compelling to think about. And uh, as far as uh, Delaware Nation, mm -hmm. uh, that is actually a French word. Okay. Uh, or French phrase uh, after the governor of Virginia, Thomas West, who was the third baron of Delaware. Uh-huh. And so it was a colonial name applied to the people that has since stuck and become a part of how this nation is categorized right. to this day. Right. Can I add another little piece of trivia there? Of course. So I was reading on the website for the Delaware, I think it's DelawareTribe.com actually. Mm -hmm. And there was a little Q&A, mm -hmm. like a frequently asked questions. Mm -hmm. One of the questions was, why are you comfortable going by Delaware? Yeah. And it remind the answer reminded me of like when someone has a name that is just difficult for an English speaker to say and so they pick an Americanized name. Mm -hmm. So what had happened apparently is that the Lenape were there was a a colonist that was trying to speak with the Lenape. And he was asking, what is your tribe called? And they were telling him Lenape. And he kept just like butchering the pronunciation. He mm -hmm. finally got it. And they said in their own language, you know, that's what we were saying. That's what we were saying. And in that, like there's a very small part of that phrase mm -hmm. that also sounds like Delaware. So then he just went, oh, Delaware. Oh, my god. <laughs> so I think I don't know how much of that is just a story. Right. But I think between that and what you're saying. Right. Yeah. Those are the two. I think there can be multiple yeah. ways to figure out where that name came from. Yeah. And so the the border, the general borders of the area of where the Lenape people were settled mm -hmm. include basically all of New Jersey. Right. A big chunk of Pennsylvania, a big chunk of upstate New York going around to the Catskill area. Uh-huh. Around the Delaware River, right. obviously, and then into Long Island up to the Brooklyn, Queens area. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so a pretty significant amount of terrain. Yeah. And so at the time that the colonists first arrived from Europe, mm -hmm. in terms of population and spread, in the New York City area, there were estimated about 80. Native American settlements and about 15,000 Native Americans living in the greater New York City area. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's not a ton of people compared to today's understanding of how many people live in this area. Certainly, yeah. And you're saying, so 80 settlements and 15,000 people. So there's about 2,000 people per settlement? I, I mean, if you were to divide it evenly, I have no idea to right. which, you know, some may have been larger than others. A thousand to three thousand, give or take, or something like that. Sure. Okay, so that actually makes it so that each settlement, as you're calling it, is, is it also, would that each settlement also be a different tribe? I don't believe so. Okay, it's more just like different areas where people are living. Yeah. So it does make them into sort of like a little village where everyone might kind of know each other to some degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from my understanding, they, it, it, on the spectrum of nomadic culture, mm -hmm. where you would travel constantly with, uh, I guess, prey, mm -hmm. or sedentary culture, where mm -hmm. you would be more often in particular spots, 
uh, they were tending towards the sedentary culture. Okay. Yeah. I think I read something that they would only sort of move slightly to change where they're planting different crops. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. And also, you know, seasonally based on what hunting was available. Mm, right. So since you're speaking of moving seasonally, since just since we were talking about it earlier today, it's so cold right now. And we were trying to think, you know, this whole week, and honestly, since we did the Battle of Brooklyn walk and we started thinking about what was Brooklyn like before we knew it, mm -hmm. and like way before we knew it. Yeah. And the Battle of Brooklyn walk was a long time ago, but then thinking about how Native Americans must have been living here feels even longer ago, and thinking about you know, we were outside all day today, but we had layers and layers of long underwear and puffy coats. And how was it for people living sort of without all the comforts that we have now? And there were a couple of things that I was learning about the winters mm -hmm. for the Lenape people in, in New York. And... I guess the winter was a time for storytelling yeah. because the other seasons were times for planting and gathering and hunting and fishing and all that sort of outdoor movement activity. Mm -hmm. And then in the winters, there's not as much of that. And so it would be a time to sort of entertain yourselves in some sort of shelter and, you know, near a fire. And something, a story that was said was that because a lot of storytelling in the Native American culture has to do with animals, yeah, they also wanted to be respectful of the animals that would probably be hibernating in winter and only tell the stories when those animals might not hear them and feel self-conscious that they're being talked about, <laughs> which I thought was just so nice. Right. Yeah. Um, and I like, there's a lot of this type of concept, mm -hmm. which I think in our culture is almost like, you know, you laugh and I, I laugh too. It's almost like sweet and childlike but it also speaks to this connection to just like what's around you yeah and to nature and to thinking about and honoring the feelings of something like an animal or you know any sort of thing that we might just take for granted now yeah and not really give so much thought or appreciation to yeah well i think it could be this the same thing could be said of any time we look back in history and you speculate on the traditions of a culture mm. where you know the idea of knock on wood you know in a, was an iranian culture that there are gnomes or elves or there oh, are right. people <laughs> we'll there have are, to ask Layla to yeah, refresh our memory about There are magical creatures that. within the wood that you would want them to not right. hear what it is that you're saying. Right. And So to like distract them or be too loud for them. Right. right. Or the idea of in Irish, you know, Gaelic culture, the idea of having uh, fairy bridges that mm -hmm. you, you know, drive or walk over and the, tra the traditions that are surrounding that and just kind of thinking about to what degree the people of the time, you know, thought that this was a real thing or the degree to which, uh, I guess, a belief value was invested in it mm. versus the degree to which it was just kind of a cultural quirk right. that ends up getting passed down through generations because it's because it is, does feel fun or quaint or something yeah. and then it takes on a different connotation you know right well I think it's also like a lot of times these 
things are being passed down from an adult to a child. Mm -hmm. And it is a way of explaining that sort of anyone can understand. Yeah. Like I think about also being scared of the thunder mm -hmm. as a kid and then being told that that was the angels bowling in heaven. Right. And just just like nice ways to explain things that like make it more fun and more memorable. Yeah. Yeah. And circling back to what you were saying about the weather, mm -hmm. I think it was pretty fortunate that this week was the week that we were doing this walk because there aren't a lot of things that we can readily place ourselves in the shoes of someone that was living hundreds of years ago and think about what it was like for them. Right. But weather is one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that the landscape was radically different than, uh, then than it is today, that's because there's lots of buildings, there's concrete. We really impress our order as humans onto the land. And of course, mm -hmm. if you look close enough, there's disorder constantly, you know, sidewalks are cracking, right. things need repairs, whatnot. But, yeah, the land is always pushing back. Right. But in general, we have imposed our will on the space and it can be very hard to see. But the cold pierces through all of that. Right. And when you're out along the water and the winds are whipping and you have to fight your way through it you you can imagine that this would be very much the same now because there i mean even in the you know if you were to go inland a little bit there might be trees and that might mm -hmm. cut down in the wind but here it's like it, this is really no different than what it would have been right yeah there's really yeah when you're on the water's edge there's nothing that we have over there now that would be making that wind stronger yeah there's you know there's the bridge but that doesn't really do much and there's boats, but that's not really doing much. Yeah. And it also made me this week having to just figure out layers and, and get ourselves to a point where we are comfortable mm -hmm. being outside 10 hours a day when it gets into the teens and, you know, maybe even the single digits tomorrow. We'll see. Right. It, it somehow makes it, for me, seem more more achievable more attainable to to have lived that way potentially like if you have if that is a focal point of your life that you know the winter is coming mm. that you know these things are going to happen you i think you would be able to prepare yourself by hunting and trading for furs and and having just a, a knowledge of what your body can also handle, you know, in yeah, a way I that so. I don't think most people are in tune with today because they don't have to be. It's we just... don't have to be. And also, I mean, even getting dressed this morning, you know, I put on my outfit for today and it included a lot of layers. Getting dressed for another very cold day, it would be uncommon for me to end up wearing the exact same outfit yeah whereas maybe in the time that we're we've been thinking about in sort of the time when native americans were living here i imagine and i guess i don't know this for sure but i imagine that if you're putting on a fur and a buckskin outfit. And I, I read that there were leggings that I believe were also made out of buckskin mm -hmm. for cold weather. You probably have like only a couple of those, if if even multiples. Yeah. And if you do have multiples, and this, I, I am just actually guessing at this. So I'm not, I haven't read this specifically, but I imagine that like if you do have multiples, they're probably very similar. Yeah. I would it was imagine so. It was practical, and there was certainly decorative um, and aesthetic things happening as well. But 
the yeah if you're making something out of buckskin it's buckskin yeah there's not that much different that it could be whereas now we have like is it cotton poly is it cotton is it linen like what it you know yeah. so many different things it could be yeah i mean this particular lens of our society that we have looking back on that time is a relatively new phenomenon mm -hmm. of you know the industry of clothing yeah and you know we've obviously been coming at this project from the perspective of having five different uniforms each yeah. day and having the luxury and also just the cultural understanding of variety of clothes right and that like i mean it almost it certainly wouldn't exist in the same way that it does today right uh, i mean variety of clothing and you know the idea of having clothing for special occasions certainly you know existed mm -hmm. to some fashion yeah. but yeah i mean you wouldn't need a wide variety of winter clothes you just need to stay warm right and i i did feel that in a degree that i haven't felt in this project previously so far which it's just like let's just figure out what combination of things that we've allotted ourselves can get us through this task that we have right can make us the warmest and also i did say most likely i wouldn't wear the exact same thing again yeah. but i was very warm today yeah so i probably actually would take note as i'm when i'm removing it all that i make sure that i know exactly what i wore so i can repeat it on another very cold day yeah it's my intention to wear the same clothes tomorrow oh, perfect <laughs> yeah. and uh yeah if it if they need to be washed then they need to be washed so be it yeah that's fine yeah so moving on to the clan system of the lenape people mm -hmm. it was a matrilineal clan system okay which was fun to learn a little bit about yeah and that means that the kinship track runs through the female line okay so that has all sorts of uh connotations or, or I guess ramifications mm. associated with it. Um, marriages were matrilocal, which meant that the married couple and the children stay with the wife's parents. In addition to this, the father of any given children actually has less influence in terms of a role model capacity mm -hmm. than the wife's eldest brother. Okay. So that means that uh, your uncle was more of a role model to you than your father was. Oh, wow. Because your uncle belonged in the same clan as your grandmother. Right. And that was where you took all your cues from. You were a member mm. of the clan that your mother and grandmother belonged to. Right. That's interesting. In some ways, it makes sense because... Well, I think I also read that marriage wasn't quite how we think about it today, mm -hmm. where people did typically have monogamous relationships, but mm -hmm. the marriage ceremony wasn't really, it wasn't the same as what we would typically think of. Like, it doesn't start kind of like a new family. Yeah. So it makes sense that this, the woman is, of course, the person that is carrying the baby and giving birth. And there'd be no point in time where they would be away from that process. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. physically impossible. So it does sort of make sense that that would be the natural way to think of things. It's not until we sort of impose the, the patriarchal system on our lives that, you know, today in society, I think it's just... It, is normal to think about it in the other way yeah but it makes sense that like yeah if i'm the one if i were the woman having a baby it would be part of my family like it's physically coming out of my body right right it, i mean the whole thing was very thought-provoking yeah to consider i and another aspect of it that was interesting was 
the way that you met your wife or, or husband, I guess, uh -huh. it was outside of your immediate clan line, right? Okay. So there were three major uh, classifications. I don't know if I want to say tribe. I don't think I don't think that. But there were three main groupings. There was the uh, turtle clan, the wolf clan, and the turkey clan. And okay. again, I'm, I'm using clan. I'm not sure if I'm using it in the exact, you know, way right. that it should be. But then there were twelve sub clans underneath that. Okay. So each each major clan had twelve sub clans in, underneath that. And say you okay. were in the wolf clan, you couldn't marry into another wolf clan. You had to go to either the turtle or the turkey clan. Okay. And ethnographers refer to this as exogamy. What does that mean? It that the idea that you can't marry within your own group of people. Gotcha. You have to go to another oh, type. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it uh, it's unclear to me whether or not this was explicitly to encourage genetic diversity. Right. Or if it was just having that effect. Mm. But that's ultimately what it does do. It prevents inbreeding of right. people by making sure that you're there's really no chance of you marrying a cousin by accident right. or something. I also saw that. So it, it is interesting that you say that it's unclear if it's if it was sort of purposeful to avoid inbreeding or if it just was convenient. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that 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 was the outcome. But um, I was also reading that I guess the marriages between the different clans encouraged sharing. Mm -hmm. So if someone would go out hunting and bring back a large animal mm -hmm. then it would be easier to feel like a community around that mm. and feel happy to share with everyone because there'd be these like families and children that come from the different clans yeah yeah that makes sense i mean it i think it is a pretty clever way to keep any potential tensions that could be going on between these communities right. at kind of a cap. Yeah. Because you could probably trace some type of familiarity. You know, you wouldn't have the, there would be kind of this more, you'd have one specific clan allegiance, you know, right. along the matrilineal line, but also there would be some cognizance of like, hey, we're all in this together. Right. Right, and that's actually, I think, something to point out as well that I don't know that we always think about, but the Native American people, you know, didn't know each other or have any sort of connection throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And even within the Lenape people, it was, I mean, you were saying it stretched all the way from Delaware to the Catskills. And this was, of course, like before travel. And the, and it wasn't even, these people weren't even nomadic. So there was a similar language and a similar culture and a similar, you know, spiritual aspect. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't necessarily, I think today often... Native American is just to refer to any indigenous people that were here. Right. And it's sort of this catch-all that doesn't really get into the details of the specific tribes or even make note that, yeah, this, the, the separate tribes were separate. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. It's from what I read it seemed like there were kind of tensions that you might expect where yeah. you people would have some tensions but not often all out war with people that shared the same dialect as them right and then uh, increasing levels of hostility for people you wouldn't necessarily understand their language mm -hmm. and there was 
there was evidence that ethnicity, which is to say like, like a totally different uh, community of Native Americans, uh, that it wasn't a factor in like abject hatred, which is to say like there were evidence that Iroquois and Lenape would be buried side by side potentially. Mm -hmm. There was intermarriage occasionally between that level of distinction mm -hmm. and like adoption between the two could potentially be a, a thing that would happen. Okay. So that was interesting because that's not always historically the case. Sometimes sure. ethnicity is something where it's just like a black and white. Right. You know, we won't deal with those types of people. Right. It seems more like just the fact that people were spread out automatically. You you have your community and then people that you're unfamiliar with yeah. are unfamiliar. And yeah. so you just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely interesting to speculate. I mean, coming from a mind that was raised in Western methodologies and also from a mind that lives in a city of many millions of people mm -hmm. with in a nation that has 300 plus million people. Right. To think how something like this would scale this matrilineal uh, culture, right. which in addition, to, I think this is a fun thing to call out to the uh, hereditary leadership passed through a la lady lines again. Okay. And they, the women had the ability to remove bad leadership. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which was another fun thing to think about. Yeah. And so my, you know, my thoughts immediately go to like, how does this scale? Uh huh. And really the point is that like, it, why, why would it necessarily have to scale, you know? Like, you, I think part of Western thought would be like, okay, how do we bigger, better, more? How does, mm -hmm. how does it get to another, another gear? Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe that's just not the objective. Maybe, maybe 15,000 people over the New York City area is perfectly fine too, you know? Yeah, I mean, it does make me wonder... I mean, I've, I guess I've thought a, a number of times throughout this week. There's two things, I think. <laughs> One is what would have happened if the explorers and colonists had never come to North America? Mm -hmm. And how, like, how would have things played out if... And or if, you know, they hadn't taken over the land. Mm -hmm. And if the Native American people were the, the main people on this land. And, yeah, I'm, I would love to see an alternate timeline and just see where, where is it at now. Because yeah. um, there would, of course, be some changes. But I do wonder what those changes would be and how dramatic they would be and then what you're saying it also is a good question and I don't really understand why our population has ballooned so much mm -hmm. over time and if that was a purposeful like more 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 or if it had to do with somehow with the Christian religion or yeah. if it was or if it's just something like I mean, I think I just take it for granted, like inflation. It's just, right. it, you know, it's the same kind of concept. But I don't understand why that's happened. Uh, uh, I mean, maybe in more recent times when we have learned how to live longer. But right. when people were dying at young ages, it was the population was still growing. Yeah. I mean, I think you could probably come up with a thousand and one narratives for why all of these things exist. I, it, I don't know. I mean, you could throw one at the wall now, but it, you could speculate the idea that if a culture is designed to consistently increase efficiencies, 
then that would be a natural consequence. You know, a, a desire, both a desire to have as many offspring as possible in order to increase or... increase the yield of your line. Right. Because infant mortality and you know young adult mortality and the age cap of people in general was significantly lower back then mm -hmm. and so you just tried to make sure that your line persisted and then the advancement of medicine was a significant increase in uh how populations if there were more people alive all the time then the populations got bigger and right so i i don't know i d i don't know if there was any sense of like trying to make a bigger population so that you could swamp other cultures i mean that's weirdly something that's being talked about now yeah in our society but I don't know if that was the case back then. It maybe it probably was. If we're talking about it now, I'm sure there was some conversation about that too. But I don't. It doesn't seem like from what either of us have read that there was anything approaching that at all with the Native American cultures and with the right. with the Lenape. Yeah. Well, it. I mean, I guess it just feels a little more practical. And like we're saying, the somehow with the matrilineal line, I don't know if this makes sense, but something about that also seems to come into play here. Mm -hmm. I mean, thinking about, you know, the, the, I guess if the women are making decisions and of course are having the children, then if you have more girl babies, then there'll be more people that might have children. And the men are doing sort of the practical things like hunting and fishing and bringing the food. And um, I was reading also that, you know, they were doing sort of putting up, like carrying heavy things and digging out canoes and putting up structures when needed and sort of the stuff that you do think of as being like the typical masculine duties. Right. Um, and I don't know how that plays into population, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think there's something there that I just can't quite get to right now. Yeah. I mean, there, it, very much the when you talk about masculine duties that's coming from a perspective of ours that was similar that there was i mean it's only until very recently that the ideas of you know dividing labor into masculine tasks and feminine tasks has been questioned right so it's we look back at this idea of the matrilineal line where and there's like some significant aspects of female empowerment but it's like yeah. coming at it from like a totally different way than how we're than how we might. attacking I mean, it right we're now. Definitely. Also, when we're getting excited about this, right, like talking to each other that, oh, the women sort of made the government decisions. Like right. we're projecting so hard. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't. Yeah. That who knows why those decisions were actually made. It seems like it was probably something that just was practical mm -hmm. or just was the way things were. Yeah. Um, while we're speaking about men and women, this is just a fun thing that I read. Uh, there was a question asked about what were some of the celebrations of the Delaware tribe? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, you know, there were, was a lot of dancing. Mm -hmm. Then there was also a, a game it was a Lenape football game. Right. And it was played differently than the football that we know. Mm -hmm. It was men against women. Mm -hmm. And the rules were that the men can only kick the ball from place to place. Yeah. But the women can throw it or run with it. The men are not allowed to tackle or grab the women, but the women can do whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which sounds really fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And spoke to i mean that 
that idea speaks to a culture trying to figure out a way to have equity in sure in sporting events you sure. know sure yeah and you know i mean i'm sure there's a lot of things that go into it that we think typically of men maybe being stronger than women but also if the men are the ones going out to hunt and fish and lift things and carry things and like moving about even if their body type isn't naturally stronger they're doing all the stuff that like makes someone stronger right and then if the women are at home sort of taking care of things there they're they're just not doing all those things that give you muscles so Mm -hmm. it whether it comes from like an idea about how people naturally are or if it comes from just that's how people are because of what the culture has put in place right um yeah so why don't we pivot to how the Lenape culture was displaced Mm -hmm. and more contemporary ideas of of where the culture is now. So, yeah, the Lenape people were displaced, as you said, and this happened throughout a number of different treaties that were I think mostly it seems like we're just confusing. Mm -hmm. So the Lenape didn't have a concept for land ownership Mm -hmm. and the colonists did. Right. And so the colonists would come to the Lenape with a proposal for buying land for x amount it would be you know some sort of traded good Mm -hmm. and the lenape would say oh sure like we can share the land and thank you for the beads or whatever it was like go ahead use this land for growing your crops for some time Mm -hmm. and then we'll use it when it's our you know whatever like we'll just share it this is just the land we no one owns the land and it wasn't until they sort of like got in too deep that they realized, oh, th- these people aren't going to share. Yeah. And this also came after working together and sharing land and sharing resources. And even during the Battle of Brooklyn that we talked about a couple weeks ago, the some portion of the Lenape people living in Brooklyn actually fought with the colonists. Mm -hmm. And some portion of the Lenape people living in Brooklyn um, either fought with the British or strategically allowed them to pass through their land Mm -hmm. to fight the colonists. And so actually in both of those arrangements, there were also this... so. The Lenape had already started to be displaced Mm -hmm. in this confusing way Mm -hmm. by then. And so part of the arrangements of helping either side in the Revolutionary War, there were agreements to have land set aside for the Lenape. Yeah. And then after that happened, Mm -hmm. none of those agreements were honored. Right. It was, you know, the ones that were with the colonists were not honored because they had never been approved by Congress. And then the ones with the British were not honored because the British ultimately didn't win the war. Mm -hmm. And just, I mean, honestly, feels very much like stuff that gets pulled now (laughs) in more current times with basically people in power uh, just taking whatever they want and writing things in confusing ways and you know making it that if you fight back you know you're gonna have a problem die or be pushed out anyway or you know too bad right so it seems like through all of this the lenape had went in a number of different directions Mm -hmm. so some people went to staten island 
where there was another tribe and they had to cohabitat cohabitate for a bit mm -hmm. and i think like we talked about earlier they it wasn't that they didn't get along but it wasn't like an ideal situation mm -hmm. and then some people went out to ohio some people ended up going out you know over time all the way out to wisconsin mm -hmm. A lot of those people were speaking a language called Muncie, mm -hmm. which Muncie, Indiana is fairly famous and that is related. Mm. It's named, somehow it's named after mm -hmm. the Muncie people. Mm -hmm. Some people moved to, you know, through many, many, many different steps down to Oklahoma mm -hmm. and then continued further southwest at some point i believe it was i might have the date uh the year off a little bit but i think it was july 4th 1886 i want to say mm -hmm. there was a two two papers were signed one with a lenape tribe in Kansas mm -hmm. and one with a another tribe in the Southwest mm -hmm. and the one in Kansas was pushing the people out mm -hmm. was telling the Lenape they could no longer be there they were being sent down further to the Southwest and they were basically being used as a barrier to protect the tribe that was already in the Southwest from the West mm. which was this like unsettled frontier land where there was another tribe of Native Americans that were apparently, you know, killing buffalo for food and traveling around and then also sometimes killing the Native Americans that were in that space that was basically like a, what we think of as a reservation today. Yeah. So all this is to say that the Lenape people have been moved, displaced, split up uh, over and over and over all around the country and are still, you know, there's still about uh, somewhere between a thousand and three thousand Lenape people in the country today. There are still some people in New York as well, mm -hmm. but not not that many. I think in more recent times like within the last like like very recent times mm -hmm. there are there's been a seems like there's been a real revival of interest uh around both from both through native american people and through non-native american people to sort of um invest in the lenape community both through language and culture and recognition and so there's a place called the lenape center mm -hmm. in manhattan mm -hmm. which is really involved in the arts and i think the phrase that one of the directors used was using contemporary methods to express traditional ideas okay so thinking about you know we just we just spend a, a bit of time talking about the history of native americans and that's often how we think about native americans is like they're part of the history books these aren't people that exist anymore yeah but they most certainly are people that exist and they just don't exist in the same way the just like we have progressed in the way that we have technology and in the way that we what we wear and how we move about and this we live in a city that's all concrete the native american people that are here now today living today also are modern you know mm -hmm. just like everyone else so the thing that is important 
um, to the people at the Wenape Center is to hold on to the culture and hold on to the tradition and understand the things that are important to the original people, but also to recognize that, you know, you're just a person living in a modern society and, um, you know, should be treated with the same, shouldn't be sort of like outcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Yeah. You don't have to, you know, put on the, all the ancient accoutrements in order right. to be considered Lenape. Right. Like that would be, it's not, you know, a, uh, uh, old Williamsburg in Virginia or some sort of, you know, situation where you have to play dress up in order to prove yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And to, yeah, and I think, I think we're pretty, I think our society is be is pretty um, aware of how to respect different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the Native American viewpoint, and you know, maybe because it is, it is something that we're taught in history class as like a brief thing, and act like oh these people don't exist anymore. It's hard to think of what a Native American viewpoint means mm -hmm. <laughs> um and you know i think one thing that uh people are saying is like let's let's find out what it is let's let's ask the native american people what the viewpoint means yeah it's interesting to think about where our culture is with respect to native american issues both how it's developed over the past 50 years maybe mm -hmm. you know if you're if you look back in the 1940s and 50s and the native americans in media are treated as the bad guys most of the time without yeah. really giving a second thought they're just props for people to shoot guns at and to have heroes you know and then at a certain point, it there became an awakening to the consequences of manifest destiny, and we've been having an evolving conversation about that for 50 years now, and it's unclear where that's going to go. And yeah. I think it is good that we as a society, as a consciousness, are starting to reckon with what it means to destroy a culture, you know, or to to get it to the point of extinction, you know? Yeah, and, which it's close. I mean, it's not yeah. there, but it, yeah. you know, it's certainly not being encouraged yeah. in any sort of grand way in this country. Yeah. And I, I don't know, because I haven't spent the time that would be required to research it and to become an expert on it, I don't know in human history if other cultures have gotten to the point where we are trying to reckon with this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's good. I don't think it really deserves much more congratulation than that because nothing is being really done about it yet. And it's still, there are there's so many disadvantaged conditions for Native American populations. And I, yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure where it goes from here, but it, it, it does seem like there is an ever-increasing interest in trying to figure it out, at least. Yeah. I mean, I think about... You're saying, you know, in the 40s and 50s and probably before that, the way that Native Americans were shown and taught 
was as sort of these yeah bad bad people that didn't sort of fall in line with our ideals and i wonder and also the noble savage is another stereotype where right the, there's some sort of otherworldly connection with the land that we as industrialized people have lost and you know uh, like teddy roosevelt you know, lived his summer home on Oyster Bay. It was called Sagamore Hill. Sagamore mm -hmm. is also, uh, Sagamore and Sachem are the mm -hmm. two types of names for chiefs within right. the Lenape culture, you know. Yeah. And there there was an admiration of, you know, fierce bravery and just an, an, an understanding of things that we as soft, industrialized people didn't understand. And that's another type of um, objectification. Yes. Yes. I mean, I was trying to say, I was going to say that the the sort of really negative stereotype, I wonder how much of that is just people not being able to come to terms with what we've done <laughs> and like how we have participated in wiping out a bunch of people and just displacing a bunch of people and how you know it happened so long ago and it wasn't me and yeah. <laughs> like well this is too complicated for me to think about so whatever they were bad like I wonder how much of it was that mm. um but yeah like you're saying there you know there is this other it's always an othering mm -hmm. um but that stereotype that you're talking about it's interesting so I listened to a talk that was an educator's talk through the Brooklyn Museum where they invited four panelists to come on and three of them were um, from associated with the Lenape tribe and one of these panelists was associated with the Mohican tribe mm -hmm. and also um, with the Muncie language and one thing, so at the very end of the talk, there was a question of, you know, what do you want people to know about the Lenape? And one of the people said that they're actually really excited that the classic way of doing things in the Native traditions are now things that we're actually starting to look towards mm -hmm. as a broader community. Mm -hmm. And things like being kind to the earth and learning to create resolution with each other mm -hmm. as opposed to fighting. Mm. And yeah, although that, what you're saying, of course, that like noble stat, it's like very extreme and it's not really very respectful, even though it's sort of like a positive way of spinning the stereotype, it's still dehumanizes the people mm -hmm. but there's something in that that maybe even during that time period people were starting to think about different ways of interacting with each other and interacting with the earth and interacting with the world and I think a lot of those things are really important now like moving away from this sort of like gross capitalism that just destroys everything. Um, you know, like we look at trees as a thing that we can cut down and sell. Mm -hmm. Whereas we really need to start looking at trees as something that needs to live <laughs> mm -hmm. and that we need to live. Yeah. We need the tree to be living yeah. to live. Yeah. More than we need money from the tree to live. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it would appear, you know, the concept of manifest destiny exists because there were a bunch of super motivated Europeans that saw another coast 3,000 miles away and thought, how are we going to get there? Mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of 
European nations that drew lines on a map saying that we own this and we own that. And, and it was never a consideration of any consequence to think about everybody that lived on those spaces. No. Because they were coming from a place of history books and monarchies and just different land ownership schemes that lived on from centuries ago. And, and that was just the way that things were thought about. And I don't know to what degree there was regret as it was going on. Certainly there were people, much like there were abolitionists for slavery, that were denouncing this behavior. Right. But it was obviously not strong enough. And, you know, perhaps if communications were as robust as they are today in terms of like the internet and just to be able to have connectivity, mm -hmm. maybe it would have been different. But it wasn't. And yeah, I don't know to what degree there was within the consciousness of America and, the, and these decision makers a, a real understanding that this was not good, but pursuing it anyway. Yeah, well, I also think, yeah, I'm not sure how much of that was understood. I also am not sure how much was just, like you said, just not able to be communicated. Like, these people were coming to what is now America, and seeing wide open spaces that didn't have houses built that were permanent and then noticing that oh yeah there's people that are here but like they move a little bit and like their crops are always in a different spot every season and well they're like following the buffalo or you know who we're at for whichever specific part of the country they were at so just completely not understanding the way of life like how much of that played into it too like oh well it doesn't seem like they'll mind if we build a house here or claim this land as our own because it seems like they're kind of doing their own thing over like i don't know i'm yeah. probably yeah. giving them way too much credit the colonists but i also imagine that there's probably some degree of that that played into it and and I also just wonder how much of it then was like being on a hamster wheel where once you start doing that, how do you stop? And then before you know it, you're 400 years later and we have completely covered everything in concrete and we're still, and now we're finally trying to think like, oh shit, like how do we give people back their land? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one could imagine so many ways to think about this. You know, there is, there's westward expansion, and you think, okay, this is the last time we're going to displace these people. Mm -hmm. And then the settlers are having conflicts with whatever tribe is there, either a displaced tribe or a tribe that existed. And then they right. contact their local governorship and say, hey, this thing is happening. And the governorship is either, you know, thinking, well, what is my election going to look like? Or, you know, it's my job to protect these people. And then more fighting happens and then people start dying and then things get serious. And then it's like, all right, well, we're going to settle this once and for all. And then it gets moved out further. Right. And the goalposts just keep getting moved further and further. And sometimes it's ambitious people. Sometimes it's people trying to stop it. But uh, it just kept happening again and again and there and at that point you've already displaced so many people and the people that you're displacing are now coming into conflict with the people that were already living there and it just right. the problems just compound it and makes sense that that's how it would all have sort of happened and yeah i guess you know moving forward the question is how do we create better living situations for the people that are alive I guess, you know, this has happened to their ancestors and, you know, technically they should own like the entire country. Mm -hmm. Realistically, 
I don't imagine that that's going to happen exactly like that. But how do we at least make people able to live life? You know, I was actually in, in trying to research for this week since we were walking along the water so much. I was Googling, you know, what is the Lenape connection to the water? And like, is there anything that's really like, you know, special to think about or talk about? And one of the first things that came up was 56 out of every, I hope I'm getting this right. I think it's 56 out of every thousand Native American person in the United States doesn't have access to clean water. Yeah. Whereas that is two out of every thousand for everyone else in the States. Right. So it's like we don't even respect, like the people that are probably way more connected to the, the earth and the water than we are can't even get clean water. Like they're living in a place where there's too much uranium or there's, you know, there's a lot of people living in a place where there's too much uranium in the land right. to even drill for a well to get water and people are getting diseases because of that. Like it's, we just keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so I do think it's time to figure out a way to reverse that. And it's it's was really um, heartening, actually, to listen to the talk from the Brooklyn Museum, because that just happened in the fall of 2020. Mm. And it was sent to me by um, a nice woman, uh, Natiba Clemens. Mm -hmm. Hope I'm getting her name right um, in case she listens to this. Um, but yeah, she was so. Uh, kind to send me some links of things to watch and read and listen to uh, about n Native Americans in New York. And it, it is, it's heartening that these conversations are happening sort of on a, it's a fairly large scale. Yeah. You know, that's in, the Brooklyn Museum is an organization that a lot of people know about. And hopefully as more sort of larger organizations get involved and more of these conversations happen a better life for people yeah can can come from that too yeah well i'd like to educate myself moving forward more about what it is that the respective nations desire yeah in terms of their autonomy and influence on a day-to-day -day and, and larger scale goals for what they want yeah. and you know just hearing them I mean it like weirdly m makes me it can make me uncomfortable even though I wasn't responsible for any of it you know just because the what feels like justice to me what feels like should they should get is like so enormous you yeah. know and and that level of destabilization seems like it wouldn't benefit anybody right but those are the types of things that should be aired like that's that's how the conversation should start yeah and and then and then start figuring out what the reality of that is. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think what you said about wanting to hear from the specific people that co come from or are associated with each different tribe, what they actually want or feel like would be fair or, you know, however they want to phrase it. I think that is really important too, because I, I think it's still the tendency then for the person in power to decide what it is that people need. I mean, even even I'm saying like, well, can't we at least get people like clean water? And right. <laughs> I assume that people want clean water, but I don't know for sure. I mean, like people should have clean water. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I, I don't know beyond that. Like if I were to decide, oh, well, let's, you know, allocate this 
land and make it really nice. Like what I think is really nice is not necessarily what someone else thinks is really nice. So yeah, I think it should really be, there should be that conversation of like, what is it that like you want? And then figuring out how to either grant that or find something that works, you know, that's possible. Yeah. And I think, you know, another hopeful thing is that I think um, we have the first or if not the first one of the only few people that have ever been in a high level government position that's Native American right now. Mm. Right. Didn't Joe Biden um, appoint? Yeah. Deb Haland is biden's pick to be the first native american cabinet secretary well there you go yeah and you know what that means or what that will do not sure but you know having another voice involved sounds like a hopeful thing and something that we should continue you know yeah. it's the first let's kind of maybe keep that going yeah yeah <laughs> All right. Well, I think that wraps it up for this week. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the visuals of Kings Highway and uh, Shore Park and our discussion about uh, the history of the Lenape people. Yeah. And like we said earlier, you know, we're certainly not experts on this topic. So if anyone has uh, information that you want to share, we're happy to hear it. And if you want to do more research, any of the places that we mentioned, that um, Brooklyn Museum talk, the Lenape Center, those are pretty good jumping off points. And then, you know, a simple Google search will take you so many places. Yeah, we'll add all the links that we had this week. There's also a couple that we didn't even mention that are pretty cool. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's actually some really awesome um, translation pages that I've read through, too, and, like, long documents that list out different words, which, I, I don't know, I get, a, I get a kick out of that. I really enjoy language. Yeah, for sure. So check the description if you're interested in that sort of stuff. If you like this video, we do this type of stuff every Tuesday with a different theme as we're walking around the city. Um, you know, subscribe if you like it like button if you like it and yeah until next time take care bye bye